because it brings a brighter future. Lock and I is from Brazil. The United States federal government should adopt a carbon tax. Contention one, shifting away from coal. The United States Energy Information Administration reports that coal is America's largest energy source, accounting for 39% of electricity generation. However, coal creates two problems. First, it destroys the environment. Rob Hurst of the National Resource Defense Council warns, growing practices in coal production decimate the environment. EPA estimates have found that almost 1.5 million acres of forest have been lost, leading to 3 million tons of carbon dioxide sequestration gone annually. Second, it damages human health by increasing particulate pollution and lung disease. First five, the damages to health also increase healthcare expenses, which annually cost $50 billion more than the economic contribution of the entire coal industry. Fortunately, a carbon tax alleviates the plague of coal. A report from the Congressional Budget Office found with a carbon tax, manufacturers have an incentive to produce goods using fewer emissions, such as by generating electricity from natural gas or wind rather than from coal. The result is quantified by Aaron Manser of Dartmouth University in June 2015, finding that an American carbon tax of $20 per ton of emissions would reduce coal use by 5%. A study conducted by Scott Knight from the Regional Economic Modeling Group explored the effects on health in 2014, finding that the cumulative effect of a carbon tax over 20 years would save 230,000 American lives. Contention 2, promoting renewable energy. According to the New York Times bestselling author Ken Fisher, should energy prices fall substantially, demand for alternatives will also fall as investors question the long-term profitability of alternative energy. <coughs> energy prices have done just that, but a carbon tax can reverse this trend. William Gale of the Brookings Institute noted in 2013, the permanent change in price signals from enacting a carbon tax would stimulate new private sector research and innovation in developing new ways of harnessing renewable energy and energy-saving technologies. Indeed, Joshua Belcher of Johns Hopkins University finds in 2014, a survey of OECD countries using environmental taxes demonstrates a positive effect on green technology innovation. Increased green energy investment creates two benefits. First, bolstering the economy. A report from the U.S. Department of Energy explains that renewable technologies are superior to fossil fuels because they are labor intensive, so they generally create more jobs per dollar invested than conventional electricity generation technologies. And they use primarily indigenous resources, so most of the energy dollars can be kept at home. Second, helping in the fight against climate change. Jordan Lawberg of the University of Copenhagen reports, if the United States were to spend 0.2% of its GDP on research and development of renewable energies, it would actually solve global warming in the medium term, and for every dollar spent investing in research and development, we would avoid about $11 of climate damage. <coughs> Contention three, a better way to tax. Carbon taxes that have been proposed in Congress by Democrats and supported by Republican economists are revenue neutral, meaning that the money raised from the tax is offset with tax cuts and grants to low-income families. Given that the Congressional Budget Office calculated that a U.S. carbon tax would raise $1.25 trillion in the next 10 years, there's significant room for tax reform with a carbon tax. Your Bogdan of the New York Times calculated in 2012 if the United States were to implement a carbon tax using the same model of carbon taxes that already exist in other jurisdictions, individual and corporate income tax rates could be reduced by 10% and tax credits could be given to low-income households to offset higher energy costs. Dan Merritt of the Cato Institute explains the two reasons why a carbon tax that reduces income, uh, reduces income taxes would help the economy. First, taxes disincentivize the tax activity. So income taxes disincentivize economic and productive investment, whereas a carbon tax disincentivizes pollution. And second, America's statutory tax rate is the highest in the world, incentivizing outsourcing. Taken together, the economic benefit of a carbon tax is incredible. Next show calculates at the individual level, but the average family will have an additional $300 per month. This in turn increases consumer spending, which at the national level will create about 2.8 million jobs and a cumulative GDP boost of $1.3 trillion. A carbon tax saves lives and saves money. Vote for us. Contention 1 is counterproductive trade-offs. 
tax analyst Martin Sullivan explains that history teaches us that the passage of a carbon tax is likely to occur only if the tax is designed and marketed to fend off political objections, both opposition by fuel intensive industries and rural and suburban regions. Fox's David Roberts further, if the tax is of any substantial size, the carbon lobby wants to cut regulations and ask clean energy support programs in exchange. This is a huge problem because Roberts explains they are more effective than a carbon tax, and thus he concludes a carbon tax deal would be a terrible trade for Greens. Contention to you is the political consequences of economic decline. As Heritage's David Kripser explains, a carbon tax by raising energy costs forces energy companies to fire workers in order to sustain economic losses. As a result, NERA economist Paul Bernstein finds that a carbon tax would kill 1.5 million jobs immediately. But the effects are more widespread, as the CBO writes, by raising the production cost of using fossil fuels, a carbon tax will also increase the cost for emission-intensive goods and services. This price increase does not, however, change producer or consumer behavior. As University of Sydney's Tim Anderson writes, the demand for carbon driven industries is mostly price inelastic, so the higher costs will be accepted and passed on to consumers without technological change. Kutcher quantifies this income loss, finding it amounts to $1,900 per year for a family of four, with impacts falling particularly hard on the poor. CBS's Amy Pitchy contextualizes this impact, when that 63% of American families say they are unable to handle a $500 cost. The carbon tax simply pushes too many families over the brink. From a macroeconomic perspective, GW lecturer Kevin Daratnana says even a revenue neutral carbon tax would reduce US GDP by $2.5 trillion. Robert Murphy of the McDonald Institute finds that the economic consensus is that, on net, even revenue neutral carbon taxes are harmful. A poor economy, besides being a harm in and of itself, also decreases in environmentalism for three reasons. First is harming our financial capacity. As EPA Administrator William Riley once wrote, our healthy economy pays for our environmental gains. Economic expansion creates the capital to buy in superior environmental performance. He furthers both raises people's expectation and creates demands for environmental improvement. Undermining growth undermines this capacity. Second is decreasing public support for environmentalism. As Times Brian Walsh writes, concern for the environment is traditionally the first thing thrown overboard when economic seas get rough. As Stephen Conroy of UC San Diego writes, every 1% increase in unemployment decreases support for environmental policy by 0.6%. Third is electoral backlash. As Paul Stephen of Yale observes, a carbon tax would be political suicide for its backers. They will become angry at a government they believe is harming their economic standing. More generally, Business Insider reports that incumbent parties lose their election 100% of the time when there's a recession since World War II, meaning that a carbon tax would be a huge blow for candidates who have wrapped their political fortunes on the record of progressive politics being a win for workers. However, even if a carbon tax is weakened by carve-outs and loopholes, the backlash would still be massive. For instance, in Australia, even though its carbon tax only covered 0.02% of businesses, Rob Keeler of the Wall Street Journal writes that voters still blamed it for the broader economic decline and punished pro-green politicians at the ballot box, resulting in the election of the militantly right-wing Tony Abbott. The only solution to climate change, then, must not come at the expense of the working class. It's only through pro-growth, pro poor policies that create subsidies can the green movement avoid the pitfalls that plague other nations' environmental policies Sam and I are incredibly proud to oppose. Climate change solved 20 times over. Yeah. That is what your long-term card would have us believe. 
No, that's not what we're saying at all. We're telling you that because of investment in green development, and specifically subsidies to renewable sectors in the United States, if the government subsidizes these sectors, it makes them more likely in those communities. The government never won. The government does subsidize right. the energy quo. But Sam Lampin and the Northern Connection said subsidies get cut when they can't afford a carbon tax. But here's the thing. Why? That's the, in order to expand the coalition, you have to reach out to people right. like Seattle. The way they reach out is being extremes to cut clean energy programs. That but is everyone, the No, but yes. no one substantial is across the aisle. Remember that these companies- Republicans make up over 50% okay. of the Congress. So let's talk there about There is that. a very large percentage of people across so, okay. the aisle. So basically your entire impact of your second intention is decreasing the possibility of these green programs being- uh, the tax Okay, sure. The okay. other half is literally that the economic harm sure, is sufficiently sure, sure, bad yeah. in and of themselves. Sure. So at the point when you say that it's politically infeasible for these green policies to be passed in the status quo because no. of Republican opposition, no, we're that's saying decreasing it's the probability of green policy. No, wait. What we're saying is we have regulations in the status quo, and Sam and I is going to pretend those regulations are really successful. And we have those clean energy support programs. Right. What we say is not only do you block the passage of future policies, you roll back the progress that the Obama administration has made for the last eight years. But I have a question for you okay. about revenue neutrality. Mm -hmm. Revenue neutral means the amount of money coming into the government is completely offset by the amount of taxes being cut. Or rebates given, yes. That's not revenue neutral, that's increased spending though. No, no, no. It's the amount of money you get in from a carbon tax, you spend to no. do the deductions. It's budget neutral. No. Revenue neutral means the revenue is the same. If, let's say I raise a tax of $100 billion, $100 billion and I spend $100 billion, that's tax to spend, that's not revenue neutral, that's no, budget. It definitely revenue is. Revenue neutral means okay. the amount of taxes coming in is does it change? Either but, way. Okay. Sure. Either way, the tax that you identify being cut is the income tax, right? Yeah. Do the poor below the poverty line pay income taxes? Um, some do. No, if you're below the poverty line, you don't pay income taxes. So you see higher prices at the pump, higher prices literally everywhere. No, you're not getting the benefits of the income tax. So that's where the rebates are coming in. It yeah, offsets the higher costs. Yeah. saying they have to look at what's most likely to happen in the United States with a carbon tax. But realizing the status quo of carbon tax isn't likely. So what we should do to find the most likely thing that would happen is look at current proposals in Congress. When you do that according to Chad Stone of the Center for Budget and Policy Priorities, every single proposal currently in Congress and for the past five years has been a revenue-neutral carbon tax. That's essential to remember in today's debate. In our opponent's first intention, they talk about counterproductive trade-offs. The first problem with their argument is that it doesn't make sense that this is going to happen when the oil industry actually supports a carbon tax. According to the Associated Press, the top 10 oil firms in the world have actually supported a carbon tax at the international level and would also support it at the domestic level. But second, when we actually look at carbon taxes in practice, my opponent's argu argument doesn't actually happen. Michelle Innes of the New York Times notes that in Australia, the government actually implemented more green policies along with its carbon tax because the carbon tax served as an impetus for a new policy. Even though the carbon tax was actually repealed, the other policies that were put in place with it actually still exist, such as the cap and trade program in Australia. But third, even if they do prove their argument that some other policies are being cut, in the United States, those policies that are being cut are actually worse for the environment than a carbon tax. Adele Morris of the Center for Climate and Energy Solutions find that if a carbon tax were put on, climate, or on greenhouse gas emissions in the United States, acts that would be cut, potentially like the Clean Air Act, would not have as much of an environmental benefit as a carbon tax would. At that point, when you're looking at the impacts to an environment, a carbon tax is the best solution to fight climate change and to reduce coal. In our point of second contention, they talk about the political consensus that's happening and talk about the economic harms that are going to exist. 
first realized that with a revenue neutral carbon tax, as our opponents say, that it doesn't make sense that there would be economic harms. The low income individuals who would supposedly be harmed are receiving rebates from the government that are offsetting the economic harms. That's why Patrick Bledsoe of Synapse finds that the economic stimulus created from a revenue neutral carbon tax would create 2.1 million jobs by 2025 in the healthcare and retail sectors. At that point, there's gonna be a net economic benefit. But third, there's gonna, or second, there's going to be the economic benefit from increasing renewables that we showed you in our second contention. Remember, according to the DOE, that renewable energy is more intensive in labor, so it actually creates more jobs. In fact, Richard Sanders of UC Berkeley finds that for every one job lost in the carbon sector, there are 10 created in the renewable sector. At that point, there's a net benefit to the, to the economy, and that turns all three of our opponents' impacts. But next, when they get up here and talk about how there's going to be outsourcing of emissions, realize that this is a really minimal impact. Bruce Arnold of the Congressional Budget Office finds that emissions leakage in the United States is from 1 to 23 percent. It's mitigatory at best. Then looking at our opponent-specific impacts, first they talk about reducing capacity. The re re er, because we need the economic development so that we can fund future environmental protection. But realize this just funds an endless cycle of economic development and exploitation of the environment. The United States is already very developed, and so we can now focus on the environment. This is a, and then in our opponent's second point, they talk about decreasing public support. But realize when you actually ask the public, which our opponents don't do, they support a revenue neutral carbon tax. Brian Carwitz of the Center for American Progress reports in 2013 that 70% of Americans actually support a revenue neutral carbon tax. At that point, don't let our opponents speak for the American people, let the American people speak for themselves. In our opponent's third point, they talk about political backlash, about how the politicians in office getting the carbon tax passed are going to be pushed out. The first problem with this argument is that this happens in the status quo. For example, Coke Industries is already heavily lobbying against politicians who support environmental protection in the United States. They don't actually show you the net change if the carbon tax is actually put in place. But second, in the long term, you're reducing this problem. Once we have the policy in place, then there isn't going to be the lobbying to stop it that would happen in the next world. Then, when we're actually looking in practice, realize that our opponents' uh, impacts don't actually materialize. First, in Australia, we saw a decrease in emissions. According to Peter Robinson of Bloomberg, there was a 2% decrease in emissions in uh, the electricity sector, even though the tax was only in place for two years. Second, in British Columbia, they had economic benefits and reduced pollution. Robinson furthers that there was a 16% reduction in emissions in, uh, in British Columbia, and their economy outperformed the rest of Canada as a whole. So it's really important in today's round to not just look at the theoretical, but look at what's actually happening in the real world. And so for all of these reasons, we affirm. Uh -oh. And I want to I want to first the lead author of what you said is Lead Zone. He's the lead author. Which one? Lead Zone. Wait, which? Snaps. Oh, yeah. He said he's the lead author now. Sure. sure. And then I want to see Cars of the Sand. That one. Yeah. 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 Who wants to Let's look at what my opponents would like to have you believe. 
They would like you to believe that we can solve this crisis because by having a 5% reduction of coal use, that's a terminal effect that you do from the Dartmouth analysis below. If all the carbon tax is doing is reducing coal use, 5% we're basically seeing no impact, which is not something that can be weighed at the end of the round. But now let's go into the specifics. First, they talk about the environment. But keep in mind, Eve, when they went and talk about deforestation, keep in mind those trees can go back. It's not going to be a long term sustainable issue. And it's certainly not going to outweigh the adverse environmental effects that happen with the carbon tax. The main way this occurs, which is known as the Green Paradox, is the way they structure most of the carbon taxes, actually all the carbon taxes that are currently proposed in Congress, which my opponents say we should look to, that they start out at a currently low, low, relatively low rate and rise every year after that. That means that companies have an incentive in order to extract as much as possible as soon as possible because they know if they wait longer, they'll have a smaller profit margin on every barrel of oil or ton of coal they extract. That's why Hans Werner State of the University of Munich concludes that the pace of global warming will accelerate with a carbon tax. Then you know, the other reason why it's going to be outweighing is what's known as pollution havens, which is that when you see these emission called carbon intensive industries move abroad, when you have a carbon tax in order to escape the tax. They try to preempt this by saying we've seen emissions reduced in other countries, but this explains why. Because the emissions are just moving abroad, so we're still going to be seeing the net environmental harm. Then they talk about how there's going to be health harms. This analysis is outdated when Marlos Lewis of the Competitive Enterprise Institute, but when actually he's quoted that the current regulations that actually reduce particular matter in the atmosphere sufficiently, such as not actually causing mass health harms. To the extent we have health harms in the status quo due to air pollution, it's a legacy of past emissions, something that the carbon tax passed in the status quo would not solve. Then and they talk about how it's going to be shifting to renewables. That's not actually what's going to occur in the real world. Their own natural study tells you that actually it's going to be shifting to natural gas because that's the only thing that's actually cost competitive in the status quo. That's going to be really bad for two reasons. One is the point where my brother alluded to and talked about the natural gas. The 70, the methane is 72 times worse than carbon dioxide. But more importantly, it means that you have, because this natural gas infrastructure lasts so long, it ends up crowding out into investment in clean energy, which means that renewables are delayed with the carbon tax. Then they give you this nitro number. And this is the methodology of the study is literally like, I kid you not, hilarious. The way they conduct this study, I kid you not, is they take up the amount, they calculate the amount of emissions that are going to be reduced, calculate the economic cost of this, and I kid you not, he divides the social cost of a life, which is apparently $6.2 million, what do you know, and it says that's how many lives you can see. It's not a credible study at all. But that also points to the next intention, which talks about renewables. First off, in order to see this reduction in increase in renewable energy, we need to see demand for fossil fuels to go down. It is Tim Anderson the University of Sydney points out, demand for fossil fuels was known as price in elastic, that uses increase in price, but because we're so dependent on it, you do not decrease demand significantly, so we don't see this shift to renewable energy. But the second reason we're not going to be seeing this shift to renewable energy is because you see this gas block that is used to natural gas takes the place of existing coal plants, which ends up blocking them out because the investment goes there and the infrastructure lasts for so long. The other reason why you're taking it away and actually do reducing this clean energy is by reducing the clean energy subsidies we show you in our first contention. Then they talk about how it's going to be bolstering the economy because these green jobs are more labor intensive, but if that doesn't make any sense. The fossil fuel industry, for instance, you don't need jobs in the extraction, in the processing, the refining, in the generation. You don't need any of that in order at all in the clean energy sector, which is why we actually find the point of Jerry Taylor reports, the fossil fuel sector is more labor intensive that's why we're going to be seeing the economic harms. Now let's go into the next intention, which talks about tax neutral and how it's going to be revenue neutral. First off, even if it's revenue neutral in theory, what Randy Simmons and Utah see is that this, this ain't revenue stream is too tempting for politicians and they're more likely to divert it to pet projects so it's not going to be revenue neutral in reality. The second big problem is that Lofton and Green seem to misunderstand what revenue neutral means. It means the revenue the government takes in does not increase. If you take in money and then redistribute it out in the rebates, that's not revenue neutral. That's budget neutral. Don't let them explain to you that the rebates are going to be going to the poor. That's that's really important because that means that all they have left is that we're reducing income taxes and corporate taxes. But as Will points out in Crossfire, the poor pay a lot less income tax and they pay no corporate tax, which means that what happens is you increase the price of energy on the poor and you don't and you actually decrease taxes on the rich, which is making exacerbate income quality and the regressive nature of the carbon tax just another reason to cast a negative balance. Thank you. Talk about how we're going to switch to natural gas and that's bad. Yes. Can you explain how methane is released from natural gas? A couple ways. First off, is that when you have to say most natural gas comes from shale rock, right? right? So what happens is the shale rock has 100 percent natural gas in it. The natural gas mixed with methane. So what they do, they extract the natural gas, and then what they do is flaring off the methane, they say burn off methane in the extraction. Let's clear something up. Natural the gas way they is extract methane, right? Like 95% of natural gas is yeah, methane. Yeah, they flare it off. Yeah. So that's what you burn, that's what burns, and that's what you use for energy, right? I know. You burn okay, the carbon. What? You burn the carbon in the natural gas. 
No, that's not a part, part of natural gas is methane. 95% of natural gas is methane, and that's what you actually burn, and that's what's flammable, and that's what. Okay, that's even better for us. Okay. Right, but here's the difference is that when you actually combust methane, it turns into H2O and CO2. The methane doesn't actually go into the air when you burn it. Okay. So at that point, how, is, how are your arms of methane being released when that is not visible? We can these couple ways. One is the fact that it takes a while for it actually to degrade. So in fact, in the short term, it's 72,000 more factors. Here's the point. That's not what I'm talking uh, about. The chemical when reaction is natural gas, gas, the bigger impact is not coming from the methane. So what does it come from? It comes from the locking out in half the methane. Okay, doesn't that happen in the status quo? No. Why? Natural gas is already cheaper than renewable energy. Yes, and that's the exact issue that we're talking about, which is this idea that when you, right now, you have a lot of these coal plants and when you that are declining and eventually they're going to be shifting to renewable energy at some Why point. Why would they just switch but to natural gas? Because that's cheaper right now. Because the infrastructure is it's really expensive to just build a new natural gas plant. What a carbon tax does is it pushes it over the tipping point. So now it's, when they're building new plants, it's much cheaper. They're going to accelerate the decline of the coal industry, and which means that because the only thing that's well, that's, uh, sorry, able to take the place is natural gas. You build all this natural gas infrastructure that takes decades for the infrastructure to wear out, which means okay. you end up locking up Here's the lane. The you never actually show that renewable energy is going to become price competitive enough during the time period of carbon tax to actually have that happen. What do you mean? Like, yes, your carbon tax would never be price competitive. That's sort of a or no, 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 but you're never showing that it would happen in the size one. Yes, yeah. we were seeing a ton of investment right now. But may I ask you a question? Now it increase as we show you in our yeah. Yeah. That's what well, you can dispute that later, but may I ask you a question? Yeah. One of the things you contend in your case and in your rebuttal that you're increasing the amount of green jobs, and that's good right. because the green sector is more labor intensive. Yeah. So the way fossil fuel sector gets jobs in extraction, refining, generation. Yeah. Any of those sectors, where does green jobs, green jobs have extraction? Well, green jobs has other stuff, it's a different technology. So what's happening with green energy is you have the factory where the solar panels or wind turbines are built. You have the That's transportation true. to take those to the locations. Which then you have the maintenance for the locations. You can do the exact same analysis because, yes, with green technology. I understand that. Those are like the first two are just transportation and construction. Yes, yeah. those can be true with fossil fuels. And maintenance is true with fossil fuels. But you have whole other sectors, refineries, production, does that happen with green energy? Jobs? Yeah, it's just a completely different sector. So, so right. sure, the jobs are different. There isn't refining in green energy, but there are other jobs that appear clear. But um, yeah, no, because you have the yeah. same number of maintenance jobs, you have the same number true. of transportation it's not, jobs. Like maintaining one wind mill is not the same as maintaining one coal mine. Like they're very different things. You can't share them. Yeah, and have a lot fewer jobs. Than them. Okay, we'll run for that. Uh, that we're shipping 
ability to natural gas, and there's methane. But according to the University of Texas, the regulations that are already in place before the EPA decrease methane leakage by 99% already. So if it's produced in the United States, we're not going to see the methane that they're talking about. And finally, when they talk about crowding out, this is happening regardless. It's not a harm to the carbon tax. It's just uh, something that's already happening in today's world. Finally, remember the 230,000 deaths that are uh, that are saved. They try to uh, indict the methodology, but that's just how empirical analyses work. Like if you actually look at the study, they do find that 230,000 lives are saved. Second way you can vote pro is off of the economy. Two ways in this in which the economy is benefited. The first is promoting renewables. Remember, Melcher tells you that looking at every car, uh, every OECD country with a carbon tax, we've seen green technology innovation, even with the low price elasticity that they're talking about. But second of all, when they talk about natural gas blocking, I've already covered this. This happens in either world. And finally, when they talk about fossil fuel needing more uh, needing more labor intensive means, this doesn't make sense because renewable energies still need the production of those raw materials, but they also need, need to be produced into those uh, into those uh, renewable technologies like solar panels. So they actually cause needed more jobs. And that's why the Department of Energy finds that for every job uh, loss in the fossil fuel sector, there's 10 jobs created in renewable energy. But finally, looking at rebates, even if this isn't part of the revenue neutral plan, these decreases in income taxes and corporate taxes reverberate through the economy, and that's why that combined, there's more than $300 given to each family per month which outweighs their income taxes, and the GDP boost of $1.3 trillion. I will take a screen back. environment, I want you all to remember that the biggest impact to go for is a 5% reduction in coal. So when we're weighing our impact, remember the best approach at is a 5% reduction in coal. We give a couple responses. One is the idea of a green paradox that incentivizes extraction. Her response is that we, they can't just increase it that fast. The reason why they have to increase it is there hasn't been a carbon tax in the U.S. before. That's providing the incentive to increase it, which means every time the carbon tax rises, incentivizes them to extract now, and that means to an increase in emissions. The only terminal impact they go for is this big, like, 230,000 lives impact. CM detail, in more detail, the absurd methodology of Nystrom, which makes sense when a Nystrom is a lobbying group paid for by Green Energy Lobbying Corporation. It is not a real statistic. Going on to the rest of the case, we talk about the natural gas locking effect. This is because only natural gas is ready to replace green energy in the status quo. What? The biggest beneficiary is natural gas. The impact is not just the harms of methane, which is 72 times worse. It's the fact that your path dependency created by going into natural gas locks out renewable energy in the future. Going into process is happening right now. You accelerate that pace to an unacceptable level if you affirm the resolution. Going on to the second big voter issue, guys, that is economic harms. They say low income people receive rebates because it's revenue neutral. Going to send into a cold drop, that doesn't happen in the real world because they see the revenue stream is too tempting for them just to spend it on other things. But second, they say they're going to be creating all these new jobs. The jobs that they're creating are in the skilled sector. The poor who are losing the jobs do not get access to those jobs. Then they say for every one job lost, 10 jobs are created. That's not what the card said. It's talking about investor returns on variable sectors. In reality, in Spain, for every one job they created in the renewable sector, they lost two in the fossil fuel sector. That's what Dara Yana said. So they Cold job, even if the carbon tax is revenue neutral, there's a $1,900 income loss for a family and 1.5 million job loss. Two ways to that ways. One is the decrease support for ecological policies going to the long term. Second, when you lose your job, you lose your income, you lose your access to healthcare. That's a bigger impact on health than they get from a 5% reduction in coal. Quickly, to give these two examples of Australia and British Columbia from Bloomberg News. Bloomberg is not a study, it is a newspaper. So what they're not doing is they're not doing a causal analysis. Yes, but like, even if they have this, that's not causally tied to a carbon tax. We say it's the causal effect of carbon tax, given how you are cutting regulations in exchange, is far more likely to see a deleterious effect on the environment and a deleterious effect on the economy. Alright, you guys ready? Yeah. Okay. So you talk about how there are only skilled jobs in green energy. 
Yeah, at the point where we still have to build wind and solar panels using materials that say you get from the earth through mining, there's still some sort of natural resource extraction. Aren't there still those jobs in existence? Wait, so the extraction can be the same with what's happening in the world. What's that? The extraction in the. I mean, yeah, what do you. Yeah, you mean that's not your entire case. Yeah, so that's, that's, no, that's not, not fully. You don't need to build a solar panel. Because you don't need to strip mine down. Your first impact of your first contention is when you come to the environment, the actual thing you mentioned about air pollution. So force wants to deforestation from the extraction. That's our environmental impact, yeah. Yes. So if you're back. saying the extraction amount is the same regardless, that means right. the environmental effect with yeah. renewables yeah. or not. Yeah. You're yeah. completely misconstruing our argument. What we're showing in our first contention is that coal mining is uniquely dangerous because of the techniques that are used, such as mountain top renewable. So when you're looking at like mining a little bit of like metals to so you're mining solar less. panel. So you're mining a little bit less. You're mining less. different mining. You don't understand that. Like, why is coal mining a different mining than mining? Both kinds of mining. Like, what? Like, to create a solar panel, you don't need as much as you would need. That's our entire argument. You don't need as many, like, natural resources, like metals, as you do if you need to get So extraction jobs You still have extraction either way. The question is how much extraction, and that's where we see reduction. That's why we see when they make a push. So, oh, one just for every one job you can you decrease 2.2 jobs elsewhere. Okay, I don't understand because your your whole war as to why this fossil fuels take more jobs is because we need to mine the resources that's, that's and these are not like high jobs. There's two high jobs that's part of it. The what first is that you have extraction, you have refinery, you have the actual generation of sure. the sure. the all of these things apply to renewable technology. technology. What? All of these things apply to renewable technology. Not, not yes, to a much smaller degree. Because you have a short term increase in construction, but afterwards the windmills operate on their own. In contrast, when you have coal plants or oil plants, those require people as physically operating in the generation, in the refineries, <coughs> in the extraction. Okay. That's why we still have a lot of your that these manufacturing processes will have to continue, right? Sorry. If, if renewable energies continue to grow, these manufacturing practices have to continue to grow. Right? less degree. For example, how many solar refineries are there in the US? I don't know. Solar is getting stuck with the yeah. Right, but there's solar production in factories that make solar panels, aren't any like coal factories. And I think the US is pretty sure, in China. Where do most solar panels get built? Well, I mean, they're built in different places. Sure. A lot of them are in China. Yeah, a lot of them are in the Middle East. Like a lot of them are in the Middle East. But we're talking about coal here, right? That's where our argument about coal. Most of our coal, I'm pretty sure 90% of our coal, most people think it's in Appalachia, and most of it's in the Outer River Basin in Wyoming. So that's in the United States, in contrast, like even the production, even if that was a thing, that's not even occurring in the United States. Yes. Remember, they have no substantive 
response to this study. They still find, using methodology that's, that's, uh, that's standard throughout all of the economic, these economic analyses that take into account environmental factors in human lives, this is what they do, and he finds that there are at least 230,000 lives saved. But even if it isn't exactly 230,000, we still show you the warrant as to why it happens. Coal is dangerous, we're reducing coal, we're saving lives, our homes never save lives in today's time. Now this outweighs because they, or yeah, then the second reason why you should affirm is because of the economy. Remember we showed you in our second conventions that we're reducing renewable technology in practice when carbon taxes have been put in place in OECD countries. There's been an increase in green technology innovation and that increases jobs, the logic makes sense, and so does the DOB evidence. Then we see that on net, remember according to Nystrom and Lundhoff, there's a 2.1 million jobs increase with a carbon tax on net. Now this outweighs their argument because we're seeing that this is based off of past experiences of carbon taxes that they've created jobs in these nations, in these OECD countries, where opponents say evidence is again hypothetical. Again, when we look in practice, there's a reduction in emissions and there's an economic benefit. Don't listen to our opponent's hypothetical analysis, vote pro. All right, here we go. Next. So we'll take our meeting minutes. 5% reduction in coal. If a 5% reduction in coal would be caused this utopia my point about, we'd be living in one right now. They try to link this to 230,000 lives, but as Will and I point out, that comes from a study which is literally the most absurd methodology that takes the cost and divides it by the social cost of life. They aren't giving a big impact to the environment. If anyone's getting an impact off the environment, it's going to come from the negative that you the green paradox that by increasing the price of coal over time, you will make self create these sentences to distract as much as possible as soon as possible. They respond by saying we haven't seen this happen yet. It is Will point out that's because we haven't had a carbon tax yet that still allows us to access the same analysis saying you're going to be accelerating the pace of global warming. But now it's going to an issue that's a lot bigger than a 5% reduction in coal, which is going to be the economy. They respond to this by the idea of increasing energy prices being aggressive. This idea that you're going to be creating these green jobs. But as Will and I point out, these green jobs are going to play. Only go to the skilled and the wealthy, so you're still going to be harming the poor who lost their jobs in fossil fuel sectors. And second, our point that the other report are a lot less labor intensive because A, a lot of it is produced elsewhere, and B, the fact that you simply have things that they extract the industry, which aren't as big a thing. Then they say other countries haven't seen this issue, but as Will and I point out, that's because they aren't as dependent on oil and gas and coal as the United States is. Then they see this all this public support already, but we're saying that's going to be reduced because of carbon And then they see this more environmental regulation in Australia, but as Will pointed out in the summary, that was an appalling process that just happened to occur at the same time. Here's why this outweighs all my opponents' arguments and outweighs that 5% reduction in coal. One, is the point where even if you have 5% reduction in coal, you need to see a lot more policy on top of it in order to solve this problem. To the point where we're seeing by harming the economy, you decrease supporting purely for environmental policy in the future, that means we also win the environment. Here's how this outweighs all their lives and impacts. Because when you lose your job, when you see this 1.5 million job loss, 1,200 dollars income loss, that's a healthcare issue as well. You decrease access to healthcare, you need to more likely to see a lot of us. Whether you look to lives, whether you look to the economy, or you look to the environment, I very strongly urge you to negate. Thank you all.